There we go. I think we are live. And so you may be joining us, uh, whether in the Zoom or on the Indiana Audubon Facebook for Pints and Passerines, our special edition looking at birding Thailand as it's uh, the time of year right now, uh, as we're wrapping up some of our uh, late winter and early spring trips that we're looking ahead to the next couple of years. And Indiana Audubon has uh, a lot of trips that are actually just been announced that our registration is going live for some of our trips uh, for 2023 still, uh, and that'll be on Friday, April 8th. And then uh, for 2024 even, we're looking ahead uh, towards uh, Belize and birding uh, in South Florida. And so that registration will go live uh, in another week from them uh, after the 8th. And so you can take a look at those uh, and I'll actually put some uh, links in the comments as well as uh, in our uh, Zoom chat for folks that are here on Zoom this evening. I want to welcome Rick Reed, uh, both an Indiana Audubon member and a member of the Sycamore uh, Audubon in Lafayette, in West Lafayette. And uh, Rick is, uh, uh, I remember you, you've told a story years ago of uh, an Indiana Audubon trip you went on. Uh, was it Puerto Rico? Was that it's the Puerto one? Rico, that's where I met you. And, uh, and you guys got a little bug uh, for some extra birding travel and you guys now have been to a lot of great locations. And, um, and one of the, I think the most interesting because once you, you, you jump across the pond there, the new bird families in that Southeast uh, Asia, including uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and, and you've had some experience in, in Thailand. You get to share some of that uh, experience of places you've been to, birds that you've seen. And uh, we really, we wanna hear all about that uh, here this evening. And so I'm, I'm glad you got your here to, to join us uh, for our pints and passerines. And, and basically I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, but, you know, one interesting fact I wanted to throw in there before you start, and I hope it's not on slide one that you're going to show us here, but I was reading here, they said it's 960 bird species are found in Thailand. And, uh, you know, so they're about 900,000 species, depending on how you're counting them. That's 10% that's of the world's bird species right there that can be found in, in one country. So definitely uh, worthy of a uh, of, of conversation tonight. So with that, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Brad. Let me uh, open up my screen. Uh, does everybody see a screen that looks like birding Thailand? Not yet. Not yet. I probably had to push some other button before I went there. Let me go back to the Zoom meeting. All right, what do I need to- well, Share screen. Ah, there, middle at the bottom, share screen. Yep. That's the one I want to share. Huh. How about that? There we go. Okay. Just like magic. Slideshow. In the beginning. Okay. Looks like we're, we're off and running now. Um, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, I did. Uh, I have had the, a lot of trouble uh, travel, and Debbie and I have uh, done this together. Uh, we visited all seven continents, and if it wasn't for a birding trip, then I certainly brought my binoculars and my camera with me. So uh, we've been very fortunate we've been able to do that. Um, two years ago, uh, we were uh, decided that we were going to take a trip to Thailand, and uh, we went with a group called Wings, uh, Birding Tours Worldwide. And uh, this was the trip to Thailand in the northwestern part of the country. See there, it was in February of 2020, just before everything started to shut down for COVID. In fact, um, what ended up happening was the, the primary uh, tourists that were visiting Thailand are Chinese, and they were already locked down. And so uh, everywhere we went, uh, it was uh, very empty. We were just one of a few people in a restaurant or walking the streets, uh, as far as that was concerned. Um, Let's see if there was something else that I wanted to say. Oh, one of the things I did want to say, probably uh, uh, you touched on a little bit, Brad, was, was that uh, you, you probably need to review this a little bit ahead of time because uh, the bird families are different and they don't mean anything in my head until I get to see the birds. Uh, so that would be wise to do that. Uh, the other thing is that they had two tours to Thailand and they were back to back. It was another 12 days that immediately followed the the Northwest, but we didn't uh, stay that long to do to do the second tour as well. Our bird guide was John Dunn. He's the chief consultant for birds of North America and been doing that for almost 30 years. Uh, no, wait a minute, 83, all right, 40 years. Um, but he's been traveling to Thailand for the last uh, 30 years. And so he's very knowledgeable 
where to go and what the species ID is. Now, just to give you a little bit of a feel for the geography and, and something about Thailand versus the USA, uh, the size of the country uh, acreage wise is only about 5% of what we have in the US, but the population is about 20% of what we have in the United States. And you can see there that Thailand would can stretch from the uh, lower peninsula of Michigan all the way down to Jacksonville. So um, I always do like to do that to add a little bit of perspective to it, uh, to what I'm looking at. This was a 20 day adventure, you know, and if you want to see any of the local sites, uh, you're not going to be able to do it during the bird tours. We always travel uh, early and so do the normal tourist things. Um, we had uh, air travel on February 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Uh, actually, it's only 21 hours, but, you know, we go across the time zone and, and uh, start late on one day and early on the next. It's, uh, it's, it's up coming, recovering three days. Uh, but we went through Abu Dhabi. Now, we could have made reservations that actually went through China, Japan, Korea, uh, but you can't get a direct flight all the way to Bangkok uh, from a, a city in the United States. And so uh, we found one that landed in Bangkok uh, early in the morning. So we had all day. Uh, to get our act together, um, you know, find our way around, be able to find help without any problem, uh, which was much better than arriving at midnight and being faced with the same kind of challenges. The other thing was, is that by the time our tour was over, the people who had gotten the connection through China had to rebook it because everything was being shut down for, for COVID. So then we had uh, three days of what I'll call normal tourist tours. And then we had another, um, well, we'll call it 12 days of of birding. You had a half day flight on the front and the end of that, um, and then another uh, air travel that covered two days uh, coming back. <coughs> now, one of the things that uh, we did for normal uh, tourist things was we stayed in the, no the, the hotel called Novotel. It was in downtown Bangkok. Uh, we walked to a local uh, Thai restaurant and uh, we took some organized tours. One was to the bridge on River Kwai. And another was to their ancient chap, uh, chapel, if I can pronounce it right, Ayathaya. And uh, the last one was uh, we visited a floating market and a railroad market. So from the hotel, what we were doing was uh, uh, we went up to where the, the pool was, an open air pool outside, but it was at the sixth floor level. And at eye level, we saw this large build crow's nest. And uh, I had to run back to the room and get my camera so I could get a picture of this guy. But look at the, the bill, especially the curvature on the upper mandible. But apparently it was uh, incubating eggs. And then I spotted this guy. And uh, it's another crow nearby, probably the mate, but it has a broken lower mandible. And I'm wondering, how could this guy survive? So she nursing both the, uh, the eggs and the mate, I don't know. Then we saw uh, a scaly-breasted munia. I know this is before we get on the bird tours, but this is a native to Southern Asia, and it's a popular cage bird. In fact, escapees have formed wild populations in San Diego, Houston, uh, along the East Coast, and in South Florida. So if you're traveling any of those places in the States, uh, you can might come up with them. And uh, we saw this small flock of, of muni at a, at a restaurant. <laughs> Okay, so then we were uh, uh, looking at uh, going to this restaurant and we got to uh, taste the local cuisine uh, and get a little entertainment as these two wandered around and, and performed. He did some sort of a combative type of uh, stance and, and movements while she looked more like uh, she was dancing, but notice both are barefooted. Then we uh, took the tour to go see the bridge on the River Kwai. Now this one was really cool. Uh, we traveled by train to get to see the bridge, which was part of the Thailand-Burma railway that was built during World War II by POWs and forced civilian labor. Hollywood's movie uh, on the, the bridge on the River Kwai portrayed that the British prisoners uh, were the ones that built it and blew it up right at the end of the, uh, end of the movie. But in actuality, it was the U.S. airmen that bombed it. <laughs> While we were there, and directly over the bridge was this coppersmith barbet. Its name comes from its call that it sounds like a coppersmith that's uh, striking metal. I thought it was very uh, colorful. 
Uh, this zebra dove is native to Southeast Asia, but it was introduced to Hawaii in 1922. Now it's the most common bird there, and it's on many other islands as well. Then we had another tour that took us to the uh, ancient capital. This was the second capital of Siam during uh, the 14th to the 18th centuries uh, until it was eventually destroyed by Burma, which is now called Myanmar. These tours, we spotted a couple of more birds uh, that were of note. Uh, on the left is the red collared dove with a gray head, a black collar, and pinkish back. And on the right is the great mina. Uh, it's a species of starling, but it's only in Southeast Asia. And the yellow bill and that spiky crest, which I love, really helps to identify it. Long tailed boats. You know, they're a very common form of water travel. And the reason is that they use automobile engines for power because they're available and they're easy to maintain. Since their engine doesn't extend into the water, it uses a long prop shaft to, at an angle to get, to get down there for propulsion. But I suspect it also allows operation in uh, the shallower areas. And that's the bridge over the river Kwai there. We also visited a floating market. Goods are sold from boats in this market. Or either you're in the boat or they're in the boat, sometimes both. But historically, it's where water craft uh, transport was, uh, was common. Now these markets are usually just for the tourists. Nearby, we spotted this uh, bird on the right, the Orineal magpie robin. It was uh, formerly classified as a thrush, but now they consider it a flycatcher. And then we went to the railway market. This one's really kind of cool too. The left image is, is where there is no train. So the covers are out there to provide shade and the goods are pushed all the way to the tracks. But when the train is coming, the covers are withdrawn and the goods are pulled back and the train comes on through. I got off the tracks for that. Well, that evening we met our tour group and the next day we flew from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, which is up in the highlands, up in the northwestern part of Thailand. Now each number represents a different location where we stayed. And then the return flight traveled from Chiang Rai back to Bangkok. These images of the male and female violet cuckoo um, are uh, fortunate in that a lot of the images that the birds that we saw, I was able to get both a male and a female uh, at the same uh, stop and be able to include that in the presentation. But the male has more purple and the female has more bars. They are insectivores. White milk shama. It makes a shallow cup nest or maybe just a pad for a nest. And they place it in a tree hole or at the base uh, of a bamboo clump. Maybe that's so that the, the, the eggs don't roll out because they must be poor nest builders. But this bird was introduced to Hawaii in 1931. Now it's very common on Kauai and Oahu Islands. Black-headed woodpecker. You know, it's about two inches longer than our flicker. So it's a pretty good size uh, woodpecker. And it likes termites and ants. Um, of course, ants are the favorite of our flickers, so they're on the ground a lot. Blue whistling thrush. And it's got these uh, metallic blue spots, and they have two subspecies. One's the yellow bill, and the other one is the black bill. The whistling, I had uh, I played it off the uh, birds of uh, the world, um, but the, uh, the whistling reminds me of a meadowlark song. Hollered falconet, he gave us a lot of good poses. Uh, but it's shrike-like, only it's a little bit smaller, more like the size of a titmouse. But it hunts from open tree limbs and it uh, likes large insects, especially butterflies. White rump falcon, 
It's about 10 inches, so it's similar size as our American Kestrel. This one is the female. The male has a gray back and head, and it eats large insects, small birds, mammals. Black footed oriole. It's got a black head and breast with a red bill, you know, reddish. And its diet consists of uh, insects and fruit with a preference for figs. A favorite of my dad's when I was growing up. I didn't care for them as a kid, but they're pretty good now. Now this one spends most of its time up in the tree canopies, so harder to catch uh, on sight of. And this non-hunting area was established to protect green peafowl. They wander the grounds freely, and you know, even uh, we even saw several of them before we got there as we approached the preserve. This is the male green peafowl, and it can be up to eight feet long, the five of those be, being the train. And it may take five years for the male to reach its full size, but absolutely gorgeous. Now this male is in uh, courtship. <laughs> the left image shows the front view, the right image shows the rear view. And if you look at the longest feathers, they're actually the coverts. The tail feathers, I'm going to point it out uh, with, my, with my mouse. You can see from the front view, it's they're looking through the tail coverts. And then this is the tail, the tail feathers and the tail coverts uh, from the rear view. And as it droops its wings, then you can see the primary and the secondary uh, flight feathers there. So we're used to seeing blue. Uh, not the green and the peafowl at our zoos and parks, which come from the uh, Indian subcontinent. So these are not as common. These are this is a rarer bird. Gorgeous. I should make that my uh, screensaver on my, <laughs> on my electronics. Chestnut headed bee eater. You know, bee eaters like this one catch airborne insects such as honeybees, wasps, ants. But before swallowing, it scrapes the bee on branches to knock off the stinger. That's a pretty smart bird. We learn by mistake. Indo-Chinese roller. I first was introduced to rollers in Africa, as I was to bee eaters. Um, but they get their name from their aerial acrobatics, which can even include somersaults. Blossom-headed parakeets. They really have an unusual color for birds, pink. I can't tell you, I haven't seen that hardly ever, maybe one other time. But they follow the availability of fruit and blossoms as they become available on trees. Move with food available. Gray-headed parakeet. Of course, it eats seeds, berries, fruits, and flowers. Um, it's popular in the exotic bird trade business to the point that it's negatively affecting uh, wild populations now. Oh, another pronunciation challenge. So a Chirithon uh, waterfall. Um, this was a stop along the way up to the highest point in Thailand. And a bike marathon <laughs> was going on that day, which was a surprise to our guides but it closed the roads for a couple hours. So we had time to enjoy this waterfall a little bit, and get a photo. This is a plumbeous red start, female. Uh, males are prettier with a slate blue body and a red tail. I had to look up uh, the words on some of these bird names. Plumbeous is the dull gray color of lead. <laughs> Not necessarily exciting, so I know the male would have been much prettier if I'd seen him. But the red starts will flick and flare their tails. And they stay near, uh, near these rushing streams and rivers. White capped red start. They like the boulder line rushing mountain streams. Red starts are in the flycatcher family. And a gray wagtail, not surprisingly. They wag their tails. 
and they're found near water. They eat aquatic invertebrates. The summers here are spent in the northern Asia, but the winters are in southern Asia down into Africa. They're present in Europe year round. Velvet fronted nuthatch. I know that family. It's a typical nuthatch behavior, you know, picking insects from the barks of trees. It can go up, down, around, upside down, tree trunks, branches, just like ours. Richard's pipit. This, this is a large pipit compared to other uh, pipits. It's about 20% larger than the American pipit. It has a big bill, if you can see that uh, with the uh, background, it kind of makes it more difficult, but it's got a long tail and it's got long legs. And it hovers uh, oftentimes, hovering before it lands, and then it stands with this upright posture. Uh, it ranges from Asia all the way to Europe. The Asian barred owlet. It's about the same size as our screech owl, but it has broad, broad rounded head with no ear tufts, giving it a no neck appearance. There's barring on the front and the back with a white ventral line, which means on the front. Right. Hey, Rick, uh, Pat is yeah. asking, what elevations did you visit? We were up to about 8,000 feet. We'll see that uh, in one of the slides coming up with the elevation, the highest elevation was that we made. Actually, it's the next slide. Thank you for that. Doi Anthanon is the uh, the highest peak in in um, in Thailand, and um, they call it the roof of Siam. And so, when we're there, it provides a nice view on clear days. Unfortunately, that one's pretty hazy and cloudy, but that view uh, draws all the tourists, which then in turn draws all the vendors. But uh, there it is, eight thousand one hundred and forty-five feet. Or if you like to, to measure in meters, that's up there too. While there, uh, we got into this kind of habitat. That's what a temperate forest looks like. And temperate means it's uh, deciduous leaves and abundant rain. Uh, that's my wife, Debbie, pausing on the walkway. We saw this yellow-bellied fairy fantail. It's small, about four and a half inches, so about the same size as a chickadee. But it eats flying, small flying insects. Incredibly, it flushes them out by fluttering among the foliage. I thought that was a really cool maneuver, but you got to work for your food one way or another. Chestnut tailed minla. It's an active feeder, primarily insectivore. Often it tips upside or flips upside down on branches and it climbs trunks uh, a lot like a nuthatch. Right, I didn't get the picture of the tail. Rufus wing fulvetta. It moves quickly on trunks and branches, similar to nut hatches and uh, tree creepers. It's usually found in flocks. The fulvetta family doesn't mean anything to me, <laughs> like so many of these new names. Oh, this is probably the, the one bird that I get most excited about, Mrs. Gould's sunbird. I call it the jewel of the forest because we saw it frequently and it just uh, really, really gets me going. To me, the sun, sunbirds fill the void of uh, no hummingbirds outside of the Americas. Uh, both the hummingbirds and sunbirds, uh, they're small, they're usually colorful, and they're active nectar feeders. And this uh, sunbird especially likes flowering trees. It's a very thin bill. It's, it's uh, evolved. For, for nectar feeding, eating. Spectacled wood pigeon. Now, this is a large pigeon and it's found at high altitudes. It feeds on fruiting trees. This is our tour group, including our guides, drivers, and cooks. And they prepared our luncheons on many times, uh, many days along the road. Very good people. You know, when, when you 
uh, see someone or meet someone in Thailand, and almost always their hands come together uh, in kind of a praying motion with the, uh, with the elbows out, and the tips of the hands close to the face, and they are just saying, yes, you know, I'm here to serve type of a, a gesture. Very uh, fun time, wonderful people. White-tailed robin, which is the female. It's a ground-dwelling songbird. Uh, male has a deep blue body. Uh, but uh, when the tail is fanned, it flashes brightly in a dark forest. I had to wait to get it to fan <laughs> before I could take this shot. Dark-sided thrush. It's an unusually long bill for a thrush, but that's uh, where they classified it and it forages quietly in dense undergrowth. Still blue flock catcher. At this angle, you can't see the beautiful blue uppers of the male, but that uh, blue contrasts with the orange throat and the breast. Notice the electric blue on his forehead. Cool. Siberian blue robin. This one's an immature, um, but uh, it is another Siberian migrant. You know, they, uh, they do uh, come down from up north. Um, it's shy, like most robins, so it likes the dense forest undergrowth. And as you can see, it was drawn in with some mealworms that uh, gave us a nice views of a lot of birds. White crowned fork tail. Well, wow. this is a striking black and white bird with a long tail. It inhabits shaded whitewater streams. In fact, we saw two of them flying up a steep incline with water rushing downhill. About all we could see was a lot of flashing black and white until they were out of sight. So I was so glad when they could be drawn in uh, with the mealworms so we get a photograph of them. Blue throated barbell. Now, barbets are known for the bristles uh, that are at the base of the beak. And in this particular photo, I think you can see it, uh, both on the blue background and the, the, uh, the white, whitish part of the bill. Uh, you can see this, hopefully you can see that some of those bristles. But all barbets are cavity nesters, and they excavate those cavities with those bulky bills. And they feed mostly on fruits, as this thorny, tree with a flower blossom there. Asian open bill. <laughs> I first saw an open bill in, in Africa and I thought it was crazy. This one's a small stork, about uh, 30 inches versus our wood stork, which is about 38. So they uh, inhabit wetlands, of course. That open bill reminds me of a nutcracker. I think that makes it perfect for grasping and cracking mollusks and snails and frogs. Obviously, they've uh, got a specialized tool there. Chinese pond heron. This is either an immature or it's a non-breeding adult. Uh, they both look similar. Uh, but like our herons, the neck can be extended or retracted. And it feeds, uh, obviously, on aquatic species, usually by standing or walking, but also by diving feet first. A little tidbit I picked up. Bar-tailed swallow. First time I saw that one was also in Africa. But it has extended tail shafts without any feathers on. And it ranges from Asia to Africa. And uh, definitely a, a cool swallow. Well, to reach some of the high elevation habitats, we had to travel these steep mountain roads with a lot of switchbacks. But we survived. Here we are on the Thailand-Myanmar border. The left image is a chart showing the placement of nearby military outposts for Myanmar on the, on the left and for Thailand on the right. The right image shows the helicopter landing pad. Now, Myanmar has been an unstable neighbor for a long time. Remember previously called Burma. In fact, Myanmar had a military coup just last year in February. So, um, 
those outposts are needed. This is a Royal Ag Station. It's also an ecotourism site. They've got beautiful gardens where they grow cold weather, weather plants and flowers. And uh, it's also a good lunch stop. Spotted doves, so named for that heavily spotted nape that you can see. It's a common garden bird in Asia, and it's been introduced in several areas around the world, including California. Look up Sibley's Guide, it's got a few dots over there around Southern California. Gray bush chat, male and female. Now these are about six inches, they're songbirds. Um, it's found around forest edges, open scrub, farmland, see more open country. It eats insects and usually launches from a perch on the ground. Work build minivet. I just love seeing the male up in the trees. Oh, that was really cool. They're small, slender birds with long tails. Notice that short bill. They're insectivores, but sometimes uh, they'll capture those insects in flight. And the immature resembles the adult male, uh, but instead of the red, it's got orange. Red whiskered bulbul. Well, that's an eye catcher. I really like this bird. It's a long bird and it's got that distinctive crest. Um, not to mention the white cheek fit of etch. But it's a popular cage bird, so it has spread outside of South, Southeast Asia. And there are populations in Florida, California, and Hawaii. Chestnut vented um, nut hatch. Well, it's a typical nut hatch of Southeast Asia, of shape and behavior. Uh, it's found in broadleaf and coniferous forests. So these are the right side up, upside down, sideways climbers. Eater flycatcher, beautiful turquoise blue. I call it turquoise. Word verdita actually means a light blue color. Male and females are similar. They hawk insects in flight from high open perches. Japanese tit. Well, it's their version of our chickadee. The name tells you that it's an East Asia bird, in Japanese. It's large and quick to fight, was the description. Spectacle doorway. Now, I just wish I had the pose with a full profile so you could really get the impact of the white eye, eye ring. It's very bold and it's got a crazy crest on it. There are bars on the wing and on the long tail. And uh, it's not been studied very much, so little is known, apparently. Hmm, sounds like a PhD opportunity. Oriental magpie robin. This is the male. And um, it sings its own songs and imitates other birds as well. It's an insectivore found in cultivated areas, open woodlands, and gardens. Apparently, it's got a high IQ, so it's very resourceful. I think of crows when I think about resourceful birds. Eurasian jay. They're found in Europe as well as Asia. There's many subspecies. This one is called a white face. And I've seen uh, different subspecies in France. But like our jays, they are omnivorous. They'll eat anything. Grayback shrike. They're regularly seen on exposed perches like telephone lines and posts and snags. Um, they usually feed on insects or small invertebrates or small vertebrates. Sorry. Um, but like our shrikes, they like to impale them on thorns and keep larder. Larder is that uh, they store the leftovers for later. <laughs> Where a lot of other birds might just abandon after the first, first meal, abandon the remains. Mountain bull bull. This name for seeding higher elevations, obviously, but it's uh, identified by its crested head. It's got the olive green uppers and the buffy. Labeled that one a generalist, eating insects, fruits, and even nectar.
this is a bird blind that already had photographers in there. And you can see the log that's at the end where they would have a place to perch uh, to go after whatever mealworms they're scattering. But they're not from our group. So we moved on and we found our own. Uh, and our guys placed the mealworms out to attract the birds for us so we could also see some of these beautiful species. One of them in that area, but not attracted to the mealworms, was this ultramarine flycatcher. It's got that electric blue and snowy white colors. That is not well known, but certainly it eats vertebrates. Collared owlet, <laughs> only six inches. It's tiny. We heard it calling and uh, learned that there's two morphs, both a rufous and a gray. Uh, and it hunts during the day, at dusk, even at night. It takes insects in flight. It'll also take nestlings. This is a very aggressive bird. Surprisingly, it takes prey that's larger than itself. It will take barbets, woodpeckers, and thrushes. This guy's insane. And then it'll hold the larger prey down with one foot while it's tearing it apart with its beak. So don't get in his sights. And the slender billed oriole. It's all golden, that reddish bill. It feeds high in the trees on figs and nectar and insects. It's almost never on the ground. Uh, it's found in the mountain coniferous forests. That's very yellow name. Oh, not really good enough picture to satisfy me, but that's what I could get. But that yellow nape, bright yellow on the hind crest. You can also see the greenish uppers and the white barred chest. It forages on trunks and branches, also on the ground. So eating ants, beetles, larvae, berries, nectar. Hill prenia. I think those those are fierce-eyed uh, birds that's looking at me now. It's got a long tail that's usually cocked, which twitches up and down, and and sometimes it just vibrates. It finds insects among grassy, tangled vegetation. White orchid flycatcher. This is the male. It's small, five inch insectivore, identified by that triangular white bib with a black border on it. it uh, it's being secretive, so it seeks a uh, dense cover uh, and it flicks and spreads its tail when it's perched. Rufus orchid flycatcher. It's slightly larger than the white, but it has a black throat with a very narrow red throat pouch, which is what they named it after. Um, and it's got a white eyebrow, you see that. It forages in the undergrowth and at lower and mid-level forest trees, also flicks and spreads its tail. Rusty uh, cheek scimitar babbler. This is a large bird, long curved bill. Of course, a scimitar is, is a curved sword. Uh, and it hunts for insects among leaf litter. It has a harsh, aggressive chattering, apparently, which I don't know. White browed scimitar babbler. Uh, its sounds includes whoops and rattles and hooting. In fact, it'll pair with another bird in duets with one another. You see the mealworms there on the rock on the left or the rest of that tree stump. And it forages on the ground, it hops in the undergrowth and ascends the trees a little bit so it can eat insects, small seeds, and berries. Both these babblers, scimitar babblers, very colorful. Siberian ruby throat. Yeah, another one that comes from far north is Siberia. It sports this red throat bordered by black and white. And it's obviously loves mealworms and other insects.
silver-eared laughing thrush. You know, the, the bright light reflecting off of its uh, ear patch, you know, doesn't really show the contrast very well against its gray body, uh, but it is more noticeable than, than what it appears in this image. But it's got yellow wings and a chestnut crown that, uh, showing up. It scratches around in the dense undergrowth for any invertebrates. Spot-breasted parrot bell. This is not a parrot. It just has a bill that reminds you of one, and it has a large rounded head. It's a massive yellow bill with an odd smiling appearance to it. And it and it's insects, larvae, seeds, berries. In fact, this bird is very curious of us, and it repositions several times to get a closer look at us. That was pretty cool. Everybody was amazed. Fivescent bulbul. Fivescent means yellowish or turning yellow. See, I'm, your vocabulary is expanding as we speak. Um, but this one um, likes rural gardens and farm edges. It's not in cities as much as the red whiskered bull. And the striated bull bull. Of course, striated means streaked. And this one certainly is heavily streaked. You can see the white streaks on the dark breast. It also has a bushy crest. It eats berries and many insects, most often in treetops. This is another checkpoint to control access to the border area. I already stepped to the side, so I thought it was an opportunity to take a picture. Sometimes when you're traveling, security people don't like to have pictures taken. We saw three yellow-throated martins drinking nectar from the flowers on this tree. That was just amazing for John Dunn. He was really uh, tickled that he had an opportunity to see that. You look at the tail, it's longer than the body, which is kind of unusual. And it's the largest martin in the old world at about 28 inches. Himalayan blue tail. Male and female. Male is really unmistakable. They eat in, in vertebrates, fruits, and seeds. It likes the higher mountain slopes, but it comes down during the winter. Large Niltaba. This is the female. Um, male is electric purplish blue, much more colorful. <laughs> This uh, female has got that iridescent blue patch on the neck, which I thought was very subtle identification mark. But it eats small to medium sized insects. Orange bellied leaf bird. Now, if you've ever thought that you saw a bird, but it turned out to be a stick or a leaf, then you said, oh, never mind, it's a stick bird. What's a leaf bird? Well, leaf birds really exist. And I only got a picture of one of them because they're tough to photograph. Um, and I was having vision challenges at that particular time. Uh, but you better learn about the leaf birds before you get over there. This one's got a blue and black face, the female. Got that blue cheek. Female's got the blue cheeks. I love this one. This is scarlet face Lyocicla. Lyocicla. Need a do a pronunciation rehearsal before you go. It's got striking appearance, I think. It's got that olive colored overall, um, but with a red face, red wings, pale eyes. It eats insects, fruits, berries, seeds. Here it's enjoying a juicy mealworm. Golden throated barbet. The golden throat is not always easily seen as it's not uh, in this particular photograph. But otherwise, it's very colorful. If you look at the field guide and you can see the whole bird, it's got red, white, yellow, green, blue, and black. Um, and you might see most of those in that particular image, but it just looks like it's all ruffled and not as uh, clearly lined between those colors, but it's, uh, it's loaded. Black back sibia. I had been named the dark back sibia. That's what was in our guidance. 
but when you uh, punch it in uh, for credit on eBird and uh, correct it of black back. Uh, it's got black uppers, wider underparts, eats insects, grubs, berries, and nectar. Another probable uh, tourist spot called the Golden Triangle with three countries deep along the Mekong River. Uh, and if you can read this sign, it says Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos is the way it's pronounced there. We're all used to calling it Laos. They uh, seem to drop the S in the pronunciation. And it's also a nice lunch spot. Vaya Weaver. Uh, this is either a female or a basic plumaged uh, male, uh, but uh, the breeding male has a yellow crown, dark throat, yellow underparts, so a bit more colorful. Now, weavers make these bulb shaped nests out of grasses that hang from tree branches. They are colonial nesters, so you can have up to 60 nests in one tree and over 200 in a colony. Hide Harrier. It's similar in size and behavior as our northern Harrier. Hide means two or more different colors, you know, like Pied Piper or Hide Harrier, Harrier, and it flies over low fields, grasslands, and marshes, mostly preying on small mammals. Little Egret, very similar to our snowy Egret with its yellowish deep flippers. <laughs> The secret's slightly larger. Uh, it's got more black in the legs and no yellow lures during uh, breeding season. Common sandpiper. If you ask me, I call it a spotted sandpiper and it's basic plumage, you know, without the dots. It's got a uh, on the spotted breast type thing. It also has the white spur at the shoulder and it exhibits uh, tail bobbing. Um, but it's got a wide range around the world, but not in the Americas. The range has started again. Here I am. This, this, uh, the lesser whistling duck. It's found in shallow waters with lots of vegetation, as you can see, floating in the, in the water there. The sexes are similar. These birds nest in trees. Pheasant tailed jacana, not nearly as colorful as the male is in breeding season. So, this is either an immature or non breeding adult. Um, and the cross feathers that you see uh, are not wingtips, but are, I mean, they're wingtips, they're not tail feathers. The breeding adult is very colorful with the tail as long as its body. So, that's uh, why they call it pheasant tail uh, with the male tail during breeding season. Spotted red shank. Well, red shank refers to the legs. This is a basic plumage. Uh, breeding plumage is dark. This range, range is in uh, Asia and Europe. Some of these get to be at great distance, so the uh, quality is certainly uh, fading for us here. But Indian uh, spot billed duck. The yellow tips on its black bill is what gives its name. Probably the one on the right is easier to see. I'm highlighted with my mouse. And it's a dabbling duck seen in shallow water or maybe walking the marshes and the fields. Rick, as you're going along, can you talk? Uh, Pat's asking about uh, the cooking. How is the food in different regions? Can you also talk about the restaurant food? Um, I thought that was fine. You know, I've got a little bit of sensitivity towards uh, spicy foods, and I really don't remember anything that, that turned me off. Was there a, they might have had a dish that they would hold off or spiced it, but they would hold off to the side that you could add if you wanted to. Uh, but I didn't have any problem with that. My wife Debbie sitting here. Any uh, recollection? Um, Two year old memory here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the food. Um, um, they had a little house with whatever you, whatever was left over there. Fed themselves. Well, and dogs, that was a lot of strange. But I enjoyed going to the restaurant. Rick, she's kind of breaking up. Can't really hear her. Oh, okay. Can you repeat what she said? 
um, there was food in abundance. Um, the two cooks that traveled with us did a great job of serving up things and a lot of local food. Um, Rick commented that, you know, he doesn't care for things too spicy. I don't recall that anything was too spicy for my taste either. Um, just very tasty, um, probably very healthy, a lot of vegetables and um, um, nicely seasoned. And Rick, I think I can add uh, in my last visit there is it was definitely a, a culinary paradise compared to some other countries you're burning at as far as flavors go. And, and uh, obviously Thai can be known for its really hot food, but sure. wherever I went, you know, I, I towards to gravitate towards that, but there was always kind of tamer options that I, that, you know, others that were around us that didn't really want the spice were able to enjoy. And there's other ways that you can flavor it, whether it be, you know, some of those <laughs> Thai peppers, uh, or the fish oil, and so you know, I always I just found it an explosion of just different sorts of flavors uh, when I was there. Well, I'm not much of an expert on cuisine, so yeah. I, <laughs> you know, if it if it doesn't uh, burn me, I'm I'm happy with it. <laughs> uh, so we're at uh, the gray lag goose. It's a large gray goose. It's got this pink orange bill, uh, and it is common in Europe and in Asia. Coming down to the final few slides, and now we have the pied stilt, which I really love. It's also called a white-headed uh, stilt because none of the black gets all the way up there. It's common in New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. So I was surprised that I couldn't find any markings that indicated uh, it would be in Thailand, but it certainly was. And I don't remember John Dunn being uh, too uh, excited about the possibility of it being out of this normal range, but uh, it was there. Then we had the red crested pushard. Um, this male is striking and unmistakable. It got that orange bill and rusty head and black breast. The female is just brown with some white cheeks. But this is a diving duck and it's common in the European towns and parks. So if you're in Europe, that one ought to be an easy one to spot. Now to close it out, we had uh, uh, our final uh, farewell dinner, got this photograph. Uh, we had uh, 295 species as counted by our tour leader, John Dunn, and everybody else had something less, I think. <laughs> but we had one from Minnesota, two from the Michigan's Upper Peninsula, three from California, and Debbie and me from Indiana. So we had a group of eight and just, uh, uh, of course, it was amazing birds that if you could get on them and get a good photograph, then I could study them and maybe remember a few names. <laughs> That's it. Any other questions? Uh, I certainly do. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm curious is uh, what was your favorite locations that you went to? Because you were able to <clears throat> be all the way down in Bangkok and spent a lot of time in the northern part. Did you have a particular region and why? Uh, I, I saw some of the, the photographs that the other guys took on the second tour because they uh, that was down in the lowlands and uh, they saw some larger things um, uh, that, that I thought were, were of interest. I would have loved to have seen, but I wasn't gonna spend another 12 days. <laughs> you know, that's a long time uh, for, for an older body, but... Uh, uh, and, you know, you have to get up to some of the higher elevations to see some of these species that we saw. Some, obviously, some of them would have been in the valleys, but that still was nowhere close to sea level. Uh, but there was there was a quite a bit of variety in, in whatever you went to see. But uh, I think the best that I enjoyed was whenever uh, we were in a blind and they put out the mealworms because uh, they could draw the, the birds in at close range, get a good view, get good photographs, and uh, not be thrashing through a bunch of woods. We saw it looks like uh, looks like you can draw in scimitar bad babblers with some worms too. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Those were those were really cool looking birds. So that, that's my next question is is favorite birds from there? Oh, my favorite birds. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know as common as as the peafowl are the the. Uh, 
uh, the blue peafowl that we see in our zoos and all, uh, you got to think about the, how spectacular that really is. If you've never seen one before, you would have fainted um, uh, because they're just so huge. They're so spectacular when they're in a courtship display. Um, I really like uh, Mrs. Gould's sunbird. Um, I like the uh, scarlet faced uh, uh, cichla. <laughs> So, you know, those were, those were some that uh, really had caught my attention. Um, yeah, I, I second that on sunbirds. You had a great comparison to uh, being similar to kind of like our hummingbirds for them. And yeah. uh, very much so in their, their fast activity. And, and then a lot of that, that, that iridescence that, you know, that just like a hummingbird, depending on the lighting that you see it in, you think you have this magnificent bird and then it's all black because you're in the wrong light for it. Um, and I found that it was easy to, to find several species, like even in city parks, you know, we were just in a park in, in Bangkok and, and there were sunbirds, you know, floating around up in those trees. That has to say uh, the barbets, um, you know, there's quite a variety of those uh, really are, were very distinctive, I thought. Um, oh, yeah. Debbie, Debbie likes the collared falconet. Is that the one we got the t-shirts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we got t-shirts with the collared falconet. Um, you know, so, you know, been there, got the t-shirt type of, type of an experience. Let me see if I can find this guy. I was also remembering the, um, nut hatches, uh, you know, it's, it's basically the same, same family, same genus, but uh, a lot of them are a lot bigger than we're used to. Um, yeah, I didn't end up uh, comparing the sizes so much, but they, you know, yeah, they, it could be 20% bigger and I wouldn't have probably noticed much, but uh, I'm glad you picked up on that. Lastly, this was, uh, you, you came in and you did 12 days. And so three days that you'd mentioned before in Bangkok, that was on your own before the tour started, but you did? That's right, it was. And then you did the, the flight up to the Chiang Mai? Correct, yeah. That's an advantage. Uh, you were talking about showing just how long that country is, but internal flights, uh, uh, can be pretty cheap uh, uh, if you're actually going on your own. I've seen them as low as like thirty dollars. Oh um, my goodness! My we, yeah, it was arranged in part of the price for us. And but so yeah, easy to build into that price. And and also as a country, if you're you're traveling, is that it's the big cost is getting there. It's the flight. But then you know once you're actually in the country, things are really cheap. Food's cheap. Lodging's cheap. Um, obviously, transportation can be difficult if you don't want to ride around on a scooter. Uh, but uh, it, it makes it for a, a real um, uh, several ways that you can go. We can go on these big tours or you can even do budget travel through Thailand as some folks do to, to see some of those birds. So definitely uh, Indiana Audubon is, has a trip coming up in 2023. We are partnered with uh, Tropical Birding Tours and we'll be uh, heading for uh, about 12 days as well and doing everything from that Bangkok up to the Northern Chiang Mai area as well. And so you can see that as well as some of our other trips that we have coming up on indianaaudubon.org slash events. And if you really wanna get more questions about uh, Thailand specifically, uh, you can catch Rick, not necessarily presenting on uh, Thailand, but you'll be hanging around at the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival coming up here in a few weeks in Chesterton, correct? I will be, I'll be there. <clears throat> you and uh, 600 other folks that are <laughs> for the event. Thanks. And so definitely, yeah, we're gearing up for that. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us this evening and everyone else that's joined us uh, online, whether you're here in Zoom or Facebook for uh, another edition of uh, Pints and Passerines. And uh, with that, I will thank you, Rick, for joining us and uh, oh. say good night to everybody. And uh, I actually uh, ordered a little bit of Thai tonight in honor of the program. So I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> Well done. Well done. So, good night. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks.